गुड नमस्ते गुड मॉर्निंग वी आर बैक इट इज सैटरडे इलेवन ए एम एंड टूडे वी आर सेलिब्रेटिंग सिक्सटी एपिसोड ऑफ ट्रिपल ए वेबिनार वीकली सीरीज सो अंकित वुड यू लाइक टू से समथिंग ऑन दिस सिक्सटी विदाउट एनी गैप वीकली वेबिनार सीरीज ऑफ ट्रिपल ए i would like to say that i would like to congratulate you uh, i'm audible now <clears throat> yeah but then it's slow it's a slightly lower I'll so i was it. yeah i think there should not be any problem at my end yes yes not not a problem so uh, good morning everyone and uh, happy to say that uh, 60th episode that means uh, that we have uh, had 60 hours of interaction with all our participants and uh, i think it has been enriching for Uh, for all of us, for our team at AAA, for uh, I think all the participants, and I believe that uh, this any profession would require us to keep ourselves up to date. And IBC is a profession, or as an IP, we are in a profession where that is even more important. And uh, the learnings that we get from these episodes are indeed priceless. so thanks to anil sir to uh, actually take this initiative uh, a little more than a year back and making this happen and this is actually something that i think all of us are uh, enjoy and look forward to good uh, thank you ankit so i think we need to thank our team uh, the <clears throat> the lawyers who are associated with us they actually do a lot of work and we thank uh, our uh, audience uh, they are regular they are consistent and the numbers of our audience is increasing also we would like to say that there is no commercial angle to this uh, the uh, it is only and only with the objective of spreading our knowledge and experience with the, our uh, colleagues so our subject today is the uh, supreme court judgments uh, we in fact are dealing with five judgments today and the subjects are in any case very very uh, important subjects one is actually it deals with the kind of uh, dilution of uh, vidarbha power industries that's a judgment which has come from honorable supreme court the other judgment is like the workman's right and it was a kind kind of uh, constitutional challenge to section 53 of ibc which was rejected by honorable supreme court also a one a very very operational kind of uh, judgment from honorable supreme court which talks about the discrimination of related parties in resolution plans <clears throat> what kind of an in ineligibility of a resolution applicants are valid submission of resolution plans without even final approval of the committee of creditors etc in fact there are five issues which are dealt with in that particular judgment of honorable supreme court then the right of withdrawal the right of withdrawal of cirp by the applicant that is also very well established by honorable supreme court and there are many things which we should not do in case the settlement has taken place and finally and finally what is the impact of uh, a cirp insolvency proceedings on 138 cases on the uh, promoters or signatories of checks so these are the five judgments uh, ankit that we would be uh, sharing i let me share my screen today and uh, that's like which is with uh, give me a bonnet okay so so yes ankit is it's visible very much so the first judgment of honorable supreme court that we are talking about is m suresh kumar reddy versus canara bank this is a uh, judgment date is 11th of may 2023 a very recent 
Justice Abe S. Koka and Justice Rajesh Bindal passed it. And the name of the corporate debtor in this case is Kranthi Edifice Private Limited. Kranthi Edifice Private Limited is the corporate debtor. And in this particular case, the promoters, in fact, they were trying to use Vidarbha Power Industries and they were saying that this section seven application is not mandatory to be accepted. And it is a case where the state of Telangana, where some bank guarantees were issued and the bank, which is syndicate bank in this case earlier. And now I think it, the bank has already been taken over by maybe Canada bank. So therefore the name, which is appearing in the caption of the, on the citation is Canada bank. So some guarantees were issued in favor of state of Telangana. The bank guarantees were supposed to be en 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 enhanced or it was supposed to be renewed. And however, the, it, the, those bank guarantees were not renewed by a syndicate bank and then it was invoked and the account went bad. Now the Canada bank filed an application under section seven and the that particular application was accepted and the insolvency started now the uh, at the present applicant who are the suspended directors of the company they in fact went to NCLED and NCLED also dismissed their appeal and finally they had gone to honorable supreme court and in and before the supreme court they in fact uh, argued that they relied on Vadarba Industries Power Limited versus Axis Bank Limited, uh, wherein it was held that the NCLT has discretion to reject or keep in abeyance a Section 7 petition if there are good reasons to do so. Now, what they were saying that it was despite the request of State of Telangana, the syndicate bank did not extend the bank guarantees, which forced the corporate debtor to commit default. Now, appellant also argued that pursuing Section 7 petition would amount to a coercive tax by the Kendra Bank, which was prohibited by the interim order of Telangana High Court. Now, in this case, Telangana High Court also must have passed an interim order that these bank guarantees, these bank guarantees would not be immediately in cash. So that kind of order in this case must have been passed. So that was also one of the uh, contentions of the appellant. Now, the, uh, the respondent, the respondent means the Kendra Bank says that this Vidarbha Industries Power Limited is a very, very specific case based on a specific fact. And we, the Canada Bank, uh, who actually is a respondent, also said that we rely on the Honorable Supreme Court judgments in the case of uh, in the case of E. S. Krishna Murthy and others versus Bharat High Tech Builder Private Limited to argue that if the NCLT is satisfied that there is a debt and there is a default, then it, the application bound to be accepted. It bound to be accepted. So this was the question in front of the Honorable uh, Supreme Court, whether an application under Section 7 of the IBC can be rejected or accepted as per the discretion of a judicating authority. So this question was in fact settled by Honorable Supreme Court by giving observations. Now the observation in this case were very, very uh, clear. And it was in fact diluting the impact of Vidarbha power industries completely. Now, what Honorable Supreme Court said that the uh, observe the of DC that the NCLT is if the NCLT is satisfied that the, that the default has occurred, there is hardly a discretion left with NCLT to refuse admission of application under Section Seven. Thus, even the non-payment of a part of debt when it becomes due and payable will amount to default on part of the corporate debtor. In such a case, an order of admission under Section 7 of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Coast Code must follow. If NCLT finds that there is a debt, but it has not become due and payable, the application under Section 7 can be rejected. So the observation of Supreme Court is very clear that this kind of uh, may or must is not relevant. There should be a debt and there should be a default then the application must be admitted. That's what the Supreme Court has said and diluting the impact of Vidarbha power. Now, the Supreme Court also observed that it was clarified in the review petition 
it was clarified in the review petition of Vidarbha Industries Power Limited versus Axis Bank Limited that the decision in Vidarbha was given under a very specific set of facts. Therefore, the Supreme Court held that the decision in Vidarbha cannot be read and understood as taking a view that is contrary to the view taken in Innovative Industries Limited versus ICIC Bank and E.S. Krishna Murthy and others versus Bharat High Tech Pipe Builders. So basically what Supreme Court said, one, innovative, innovative Industries Limited prevails. Number two, E.S. Krishna Murthy prevails. Number three, the Vidarbha gets diluted. So I think this is very, very important because see what the last about five months or six months, we all have been talking about Vidarbha and the impact of Vidarbha on the insolvency. So I think we should actually now feel comfortable, relaxed, that there is no adverse impact on insolvency profession by the Vidarbha judgment. This is very clear that innovative industries prevail, ES Krishnamurti prevails, but the Vidarbha gets diluted because it was actually a case which with a very set uh, facts. Now the Supreme Court also says and continues to observe that the amount payable also included the amounts under the fund-based overdraft facility because I, I think the uh, appellant in this case was arguing that it was the non-fund-based facilities and it was not renewed and therefore it was rejected or it was info invoked. Supreme Court says that there were some fund-based facilities were also and the, uh, the order of Telangana High Court did not relate to any of the, uh, uh, did not relate to all the bank guarantees given by Canada Bank. So that particular order where some coercive action was protected by High Court of Telangana, that was only on few bank guarantees. However, there were some other bank guarantees, there are some other non-fund fund-based facilities where there were defaults for there. So therefore it was concluded that in the facts of this present case, there were no good reasons for NCLT to exercise its discretion and reject the Section 7 application. So that was finally held by the Supreme Court. So now let us see finally, final decision of the Supreme Court says like this. The Supreme Court referred to their decision in Innovative Industries Limited versus ICICI Bank and others, wherein the entire scope of Section 7 was explained. And it was held that if NCLT is satisfied, there is a debt and default. It is bound to admit a petition under Section 7 of the IBC, which was reiterated in ES Krishna Murthy and others versus Bharat High Tech Builders Private Limited, while holding that NCLT cannot direct parties to enter into settlement terms. So this was final decision of the Honorable Supreme Court. Ankit, any kind of comments that you would like to add? I think this is a very, very important judgment and uh, rather all the applications that are pending in the NCLTs and the NCLATs and the High Courts with respect to Section 7 applications on the basis of Vidarbha, they are bringing this judgment to the knowledge of the judges is very, very important, very, very crucial so that the decision making on Section 7 applications kind of gets expedited. Uh, this, is, this judgment is very, very important and yes, the uh, <clears throat> uh, the review petition judgment that we had for Innoventive uh, for um, uh, for Vidarbha clarified a little bit that this is a case-specific judgment. This one further clarifies that the uh, the, the principles laid down in these two, ju two judgments earlier still prevail. The only difficulty that can still come out is that somebody or some CD can continue to argue that the facts of my case are exactly as Vidarbha's and therefore Vidarbha applies to me. And there, uh, when we come to facts Sorry. that are only for Vidarbha, there we can discuss briefly on what are those exact facts in Vidarbha that somebody can use or misuse to delay the Section 7 application and what can be the defense against those specific facts. Ankit, in the case of Vidarbha, it was more than 1,700 crores of uh, uh, arbitration claim was won by Vidarbha Industries and their default was also uh, lesser than this amount. However, the other party filed a petition before the Honorable Supreme Court, which is, which is likely to be won by Vidarbha. So therefore, the Supreme Court said it is only a time scenario 
once the Supreme Court gives a judgment on the 1767, 1767 crore, I believe. And then in that case, this will resolve the insolvency of this company. So it is only a, it is only a very, very kind of a, a time issue and not an insolvency issue. So therefore, uh, the that was also pending with the same bench, probably. Mm -hmm. The bench which has passed this uh, with Arba judgment. And they, in fact, uh, they had one option, one to pass that particular judgment first and then uh, do this. But I believe they use this word may. And my understanding also is there that there is still a possibility of uh, having some kind of uh, uh, facts of a case where this may word would be used. Where this may word would be used in case of... Uh, uh, something which comes from a particular scenario where the company is asset rich. However, there is some kind of temporary fund flow mismatch, some kind of uh, very, very negative impact of any particular event on a particular industry or kind of any natural calamity on a particular uh, industry. So in all these scenarios, some can say that this is not something which is uh, dealing with insolvency. It is dealing with the natural calamity. It is dealing with the industrial uh, scenario for a particular segment of industry. So that, uh, in any case, the government has also already taken a power uh, that in case of any specific industries, the, um, um, the we have seen in the proposed amendment, when this monsoon budget will come, we might see that amendment, that the government will have power that for some specific uh, industry or some specific fact, they can exclude some segment of industries. So maybe... Uh, that impact would be there. So, so my interpretation uh, to, to further what you said, I think the the particular facts about Vidarbha that can be you know differentiated in by by an advocate who is fighting for a financial institution or a bank for a Section Seven application can be that one in Vidarbha there was a matter or an arbitration matter which was pending for settlement in the Supreme Court itself, and as you said that the assets were more than the liabilities that can be uh, uh, of course fought against and also this time gap thing that you said is also something that can kind of be differentiated that where a lot of time has elapsed in an account being an NPA there again that can be used all right let's go forward so I think we can move for the next second uh, uh, judgment and second judgment is regarding the workmen rights and the rights of the tax authorities However, this application was filed by Mozerbeer Karamchari Union versus Union of India. And this was, uh, as you know, the corporate debtor in the case was Mozerbeer's India Limited. This is a judgment dated 2nd of May 2023. And it was given by Honorable Justice Mukesh Kumar, Rasik Baisha, and uh, Mr. S uh, Justice Sanjeev Khanna. So these are the, uh, uh, so in this particular case, the basic challenge by the Moserbeer Karamchari Union was on, it was a writ petition under Article 32 of Constitution of India, where they were actually seeking, they were seeking that the amendment which was done in Section 327, amendment which was done in Section 327 of the Companies Act, where Subsection 7 was introduced along with the uh, promulgation of uh, Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code, and it was said in that subsection 7 that the section 326 and 327, the distribution as per the Companies Act, that would not be applicable in those companies where the uh, companies are being liquidated under IBC. Now, what was there in section 326 and what is there in section 53? Section 53 gives a waterfall arrangement for distribution of proceeds. Also, Section 326 also gave the same. However, Section 326, as per of the Companies Act, actually gave some priority. It was giving some priority to workmen dues, also to the revenue taxes, cesses due from the company to the union government, a state government, or a local authority. So these were the two things, in fact, that was getting impacted adversely because in Section 53, Workman is pari passu with the secured creditors and the employees are uh, after the secured creditors are paid. And in this case, the state government and the central government, the statutory dues are 
in fact, getting the fifth priority. So, however, this was not an application uh, uh, from the state government authorities or the central government authorities. It was an application from the Workmen's Union of uh, Mozambique. So they were saying that this particular amendment, like insertion of subsection 7 into 327 of Companies Act, that should be considered as unconstitutional. However, the Supreme Court said that it is a well thought of and it is uh, not something which is impacting the rights because see the law, uh, IBC is a full code. It actually has been drafted in such a manner that there is a priority to workmen also. There is a priority to workmen also. See, even otherwise, uh, Ankit, like when we see the winding up proceedings under the Companies Act was a completely a different uh, scenario. Whereas the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Act is a different scenario. In Insolvency and Bankruptcy Act, we are first trying to resolve it. And even during resolution process, the impact of Section 53 is seen and it can be used. However, in case the resolution is not found, then we go to liquidation and that liquidation where the assets would be liquidated by the liquidator and the timelines are very short and that actually would be given to the stakeholders as per section 53. However, in the case of winding up, which was basically monitored by high courts and those winding up section 326 was the section for distribution uh, waterfall arrangement. So in, in section 53 now, uh, we have uh, uh, the workman's salary is uh, a kind of pari uh, passu uh, with the secured creditors to the extent of 24 months. And beyond this, it actually will fall other creditors, which is a sixth priority. So in, in this uh, case, finally, uh, Section 327 uh, provided some kind of priorities. Section 327 provided some preferential payment priority. And in you can see that the all revenues, taxes, says, then B says all wages or salaries, then accrued holiday remuneration, that is also workman employees, then the company is being voluntary pump. That's it. The, the sub clause D deals with the voluntary this thing. So these are the some kind of preferential payments under Section 327 of the Companies Act. However, the Section 7 was introduced in this particular Section 327. In that subsection 7, it says Section 326 and 327 shall not be applicable in the event of liquidation under the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code 2016. This was added with effect from 1st of November, no, sorry, 1st of December 2016, matching with the implementation of the IBC. So this was the uh, Section 326 and 327, whereas when we see Section 53 of the IBC, it now says that the priority is the, the uh, CIRP and the liquidation cost, and then comes is the workman dues. And that, that is also for the 24 months preceding the liquidation commencement date. And uh, then we see the uh, other, of course, that other is not uh, uh, discussions. The discussion is the work and due shall be as per the companies that that is also defined. Now, the, the discussions, in fact, the, 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 in fact, in this case, the amicus, uh, uh, amicus curry was appointed by Honorable Supreme Court to understand the section 326, 327 impact of all these amendments. And it was uh, finally uh, argued uh, by the uh, amicus curry that the Swiss Ribbon Private Limited, uh, the judgment of Honorable Supreme Court, in fact, uh, it was uh, held by Honorable Supreme Court that the constitutional validity of several provisions of IBC, including waterfall arrangement under section 53 was upheld. This was the argument number one. And then also it was said that in the case of Committee of Creditors of Assets Steel Limited versus Tish Kumar Gupta, it was held that the principle of equality for all cannot be stressed to treat financial and operational creditors on par as this would defeat the entire objective of the IBC. So therefore, uh, the court also held that the amendments made to IBC that guaranteed a minimum of liquidation value to operational creditors was, uh, uh, was not ultra wise to section 14. Now the petitioner, petitioner means the 
Karamchari Union, Karamchari Union of Mozambique. They were trying to say uh, that the uh, under the company's law, this was the benefit which was given to uh, them. And then the it, in the, under the company's of under under the company there was a priority. Now under section thirty six subsection four of the IBC still there is a priority regarding the provident fund, pension fund, and gratuity fund. But then he, they were trying to say that it is basically a violative of uh, Article 21 of the uh, Constitution of India. Uh, but then finally, uh, at the, all these uh, arguments were in fact uh, were taken. And like uh, now the Supreme Court in fact decided on this issue, whether the waterfall mechanism in insolvency and bankruptcy code versus section 326 of the Companies Act, uh, which shall prevail over each other. Now, in this particular case, the observations of the Honorable Supreme Court are very clear. It says that in view of the enactment of IBC and Section 53 of the IBC, it necessitated to amend the Act 2013. Act means Companies Act. As per Section 327, subsection 7, Section 326 and 327 shall not be applicable in the end, event of liquidation under IBC. The object and purpose of amending the Act, Act means Companies Act, and to exclude Section 326 and 327 in the event of liquidation under the IBC seems to be that there may not be two different provisions with regard to winding up or liquidation of the company. Therefore, in view of the enactment of IBC, it necessitated to exclude the applicability of Section 326 and 327 of the Companies Act, which cannot be said to be arbitrary or as contended on behalf of the practitioner. Now the court again, the, the Supreme Court further said that section 327 subsection seven, which is under challenge shall be applicable in case of liquidation of a company under IBC, meaning thereby that in case of liquidation of a company under IBC, the provisions of section 53 of the IBC and other provisions of IBC shall be applicable as the company is ordered to be liquidated or wound up under the provisions of IBC. Because under earlier regime, in case of winding up of the company under the act, the dues of the workman may have pari passu equal footing with that of the secured creditor. The petitioner cannot claim the same benefit in case of winding up or uh, liquidation under IBC. So the parties are governed uh, in that manner. So the uh, Ankit, further the Supreme Court observed that the issue with regard to the workman and the secured creditor shall being kept at equal footing under section 53 of the IBC is only in the case wherein the secured creditors has relinquished its security and the same is at the is, and the same is the part of the stage of the liquidation pool now this is not correct in fact uh, the uh, then the supreme court also clarified that companies that does not deal with the insolvency and bankruptcy when the companies are unable to pay their debt or the aspects relating to revival and rehabilitation of the companies and their winding up if the revival and rehabilitation is not possible. Now this principle, now in principle it can, it, it can be doubted that the cases of revival or winding up of the company on the ground of insolvency and inability to pay debts are different from those cases where the companies are being wound up under section 271 of the Companies Act. However, in this case, the Supreme Court also observed that there are similar provisions in the IBC also, where the provident fund, pension fund, and the gratuity fund are being protected. So those are not something which is at loss. And it also said that even in the case of, uh, even if even if the security interest is not relinquished in uh, in favor of liquidation estate of the company, even in that case, the workman due is protected because the regulation. 21. Regulation 21 says, uh, Regulation 21 of the IBBI liquidation process regulation says that even in the case some creditor, some secured creditor is not relinquishing his, its security interest in favor of the liquidation estate, then that secured creditor first will make payment for the CIRP cost if pending, liquidation cost, and then the Secured creditor will also pay workman dues, workman dues as proportionate to that asset which is not being relinquished. So, therefore, the workman is protected 
and it is incorrect to say that this workman's paripasu rights are only in case of relinquishment of security interest. The Supreme Court clarified <clears throat> that there is a regulation 21 capital A of the liquidation process regulation which takes care that if any particular creditor is not relinquishing its security interest, that would not mean that the workers will not get their dues. Workers will get their dues and it would be the obligation of the person of that secured creditor to first make payment of the CIRP cost and the liquidation cost and the workman dues. So the uh, finally, the decision of the Supreme Court was absolutely clear that uh, there is uh, uh, no way that we can say that there is any constitutional uh, invalidity. Section 53 is constitutional. The workman dues are very clearly paripasu with the uh, paripasu with the uh, secured creditor. Their rights are protected as regards provident fund, gratuity fund, and superannuation fund. Their rights are well protected that any money in these funds would not become part of the liquidation estate. So this is what was clear clarified in this particular uh, judgment. So whatever efforts were being by may, being made by Moser Bear Karamchari Union would not uh, get any success. Uh, so Ankit, you please add uh, uh, on this. I think uh, um, this is a, a good judgment which clarifies 53. Although 53, there is a change that is being proposed in the draft regulations. Maybe there are other changes that are proposed. So let's see what is the final version that comes out. <laughs> the the version that we have seen in the discussion paper does reject this entire process and kind of divides the creditors between secured and unsecured and still provides a priority for workmen if I'm not wrong. Uh, so that that would further simplify the waterfall mechanism. We move on to the third judgment of uh, the day and uh, the third judgment is M.K. Raja Gopalan versus Dr. Piriya Sami Palani and uh, this judgment is dated 3rd of May 2023. In fact, I covered some part of this judgment in my I think 57th or 58th episode but that was not full. I only covered the one part of this judgment which was related party concept. It was also said in this case that in a resolution plan, al making allocation to related party is not mandatory and any uh, kind of uh, uh, discrimination, discrimination between the uh, unsecured creditor and unsecured creditors who are, who are related party is possible. Similarly, discrimination between uh, secured creditor and secured creditor related party is possible. So that was the only concept that I handled in this particular judgment in the last uh, when I dealt with it. So in this particular case, the Tourism Finance Corporation filed a petition under Section 7 and the name of the corporate debtor in this case is Appu Hotels Limited. Uh, NCLT admitted in uh, uh, May 20, NCLT admitted in May 20 and the resolution plan was submitted by M.K. Raja Gopalan. M.K. Raja Gopalan uh, is the resolution applicant and it was approved with 87% uh, voting share. Several objections were raised by various financial creditors, other resolution applicant, and by the promoter and erstwhile director of the corporate debtor against the resolution plan. Promoter and erstwhile director, they also raised some objections. Various financial creditors raised objections. Resolution applicants also raised objections. So this is uh, with the status of various objections. Now, uh, the promoter also stated his grievance about want of consideration for his settlement proposal. The promoters were saying that his settlement proposal is pending and Section 12A of the code and the NCLT dismissed all the objections and approved the resolution plan, declaring it binding on the corporate debtor and other stakeholders by the common order. Approval of the resolution plan was challenged before NCLAT on various grounds. The approved resolution plan was challenged in the NCLAT it, and the proceedings before the NCLAT, the proceedings before the NCLAT where there were basically various uh, objections on the resolution plan. Uh, the 
uh, NCL 80 declared the residential plan ineligible in terms of section 88 of the Indian Trust Act 1882 and disqualified in terms of section 164 subsection 2 clause B of the Companies Act 2013. Issued directions to the resolution professional to proceed with the CIRP from the stage of publication of the Form D while inviting expression of interest afresh as per the CIRP regulation. The appellate tribunal also issued directions to the resolution professional to place the settlement proposal of the promoter and earth file director of the corporate debtor for consideration before the COC. And if such a proposal was approved with 90%, voting share of the COC to initiate the proceedings for withdrawal of CIRP under Section 12A of the Code. The appellate tribunal also directed that the claim of the related party financial operational is not discriminated uh, from that of the understated uh, unrelated financial uh, parties. Now, the successful resolution applicant filed an appeal before the Honorable Supreme Court because, see, the application resolution plan was rejected and successful resolution applicant was aggrieved. So therefore, the resolution plan, it was the, therefore, uh, the appeal was preferred by the successful resolution applicant before Honorable Supreme Court. Now, there were many grounds of uh, the challenges, many grounds of the challenges that we can see. Uh, the it was also challenged that the valuation uh, report was not uh, uh, correct. And the form G was not published on designated website. The commercial wisdom of the COC was not justifiable. And once the COC had approved the resolution plan by the requisite majority, there was very limited scope of interference by the courts. Appellate tribunal has overstepped its jurisdiction by declaring the resolution applicant ineligible under Section 88 of the Trust Act and the disqualification under Section 164 of the Companies Act. The claim of related party creditors cannot be treated at par with the answered unrelated creditors, cannot be treated at par uh, with the unrelated creditors and Section 12A. So there were very various points for determination and I will take up one by one the points. Uh, the first point in this case was uh, whether the valuation process of the assets of the corporate debtor had been in violation of the regulation 27 and 35 of the CIRP and thereby approval of the resolution plan had been in contravention of section 30 subsection 2. So like we can see the uh, what is the observation of the Supreme Court regarding the uh, valuation part. Uh, the so that is uh, uh, not kind of considered as the uh, uh, kind uh, as kind of uh, something which can actually impact the resolution plan. So the whether there had been a non-compliance of Regulation 36 Capital A of the CIP regulations for warrant of publication of Form G on the designated website not later than 75th day from the insolvency commencement date and the failure to advertise as mandated had a direct impact on the maximization of the assets value, particularly when the entire CIR was conducted during lockdown at the time. So this was also relaxed by Honorable Supreme Court. So it was not really very big cognizance because see, the, finally the Supreme Court said that the, uh, the order of ANCLAT is uh, erroneous on some cases and on some cases the order is good. So whether the resolution applicant is ineligible to submit a resolution plan, this I will also come. Then the trust issue. Uh, so these are, in fact, D and G, all these are issues were there in the, uh, then there are sections 162. Now the, we will move to the main outcome of the judgment. Now the first outcome of the judgment is, Non-provision for related party creditors in resolution plan does not violate any provision of law, nor the principle of non-discrimination. It was noticed in this case that the related parties were not related parties were not offered the same amount which is being offered to the other parties. So NCLAD in fact said that the discrimination cannot be made in resolution process with the 
same class of creditors irrespective of whether they are related parties or not. However, the Supreme Court has said that the related parties can be discriminated because even if we distribute anything to related parties, it would be considered as a benefit to the suspended management, benefit to the earlier management. So that was turned down that this is not discrimination if the uh, if the allocation is made in which the related parties are not being offered any amount or less amount and the other same class of creditors are being offered higher amount so that is not something which is challengeable because see the related parties are part of the promoters and they can be discriminated while distributing ankit can can we see the questions because i can see some questions are also coming so one question that has come is that uh, um, animesh she is asking that if the rp has done requisite due diligence for section 29a can nclt and clad still go into that question and what is the remedy in such a circumstance so i think yes they can go into that question if somebody raises a dispute that 29a compliance is not there and somebody can challenge a resolution plan based on that um yes then second question that is here is uh, uh how is the liquidation cost apportioned to the secured creditors is it based on the voting share or the amount which is realized so these are both the questions are not relevant to our ppts but we can still try and answer them so what is the second question i couldn't hear that uh the second question was that how is the liquidation cost apportioned to the secured creditor and is it based on the voting share or the amount which is realized it is based on the amount which is realized okay it is based on the amount which is realized and it is not based on the voting share right so these are the only two questions so ankit the third which question which is settled by this uh, by by honorable supreme court it, what is ineligibility under section 29 capital a mm -hmm. and vis-a-vis -vis section 164 2b of the companies act now in this case there are some non compliance which are being done by the company's management like we have uh, discussed we had discussed in the past and i think you summarize this uh, judgment yes, yes, uh, you can, kind you of you can summarize you can yeah, summarize this this, this judge, yeah so this judgment in 29a or with respect to 29a simply kind of uh, summarize that in case there is a default uh, which has been uh, made that does not which can lead to disqualification that does not mean that there is a disqualification so you have to simply look at mca status and see in case the din status is active compliant then the disqualification in 29a with respect to the director's eligibility is good enough so it kind of simplified the whole process because a lot of us were going deeper into this process and trying to get a lot of documents for the directors but now it is justified that 29a compliance with respect to disqualification of a director is not required to be looked into deeper beyond the mca status showing up on mc21 website so i think this was also good and the this final one point is very important <clears throat> the bench opined <clears throat> that the irregularity of not placing the revised plan after ninth meeting before coc and directly placing it before nclt for approval cannot be ignored as a mere technicality the financial layout of the resolution plan has to be considered by the coc before it could be said to have arrived at a considered decision so what we do normally is that there are various versions of resolution plan there are various negotiation in the resolution plan and whenever we actually go through this kind of process and we finish with the time and finally the resolution plan whatever final resolution plan comes that we normally give to the uh, nclt directly and without even getting it uh, voted uh, again so that's what the supreme court says that this is not something that can be accepted as a technical error so this is uh, uh, not acceptable so therefore the coc must approve a resolution plan even if there is a slightest of modification uh, so that cannot directly go to the nclt without approve getting the approval of the coc and then 
I think this is also good. Uh, Settlement proposal, of course, can be considered at any stage. Uh, resolution professional in case of corporate debtor is under corporate insolvency resolution process. There is no provision in the act for returns during liquidation of a case. The bench held that the resolution plan could not have been approved by the NCLT on the twin reasons. So these are the two reasons that the Supreme Court has considered and said that the resolution plan could not have been approved by NCLT on twin reasons. Uh, the there is a the NCLAT judgment, which actually, uh, in fact, considered and rejected. Now the resolution plan uh, could not have been approved by the NCLT on the twin reasons, and then there is a the Supreme Court said that it it can actually go back. It can go back to the a committee of creditors for these corrections. So now the hope that the resolution plan will be accepted. So, uh, so until we go on to Abhishek Singh versus Hutamaki PPL Limited, and this is a case where the corporate debtor is Man Pasand Beverages Limited, and in the case of Man Pasand Beverages Limited, in fact, this company suffered. Uh, just because of nothing. Man Pasand Beverages Limited suffered because of nothing. This judgment is given by Honorable Justice Bhushan Ramakrishna Gavai and Mr. Justice Vikram Nath. So these, uh, uh, this judgment is regarding the, uh, this judgment is regarding uh, this uh, one section uh, nine petition was filed against Man Pasand Beverages, NCLT passed an order admission. And within two days, like 1st March 21 is the date of passing of the order and the 3rd March 2021, the operational creditor and the corporate debtor entered into a settlement. And the above settlement was arrived at even before the committee of creditors was constituted. Total amount was also paid. It was not only a promise, it was paid and was paid by the uh, OC. Now the, in this case, the interim, the interim uh, resolution professional uh, on 10th of uh, March 21, moved an application under Regulation 30A of the CIP regulation seeking withdrawal of CIRP against the CD. In the meantime, appeal was preferred against the admission order before NCLAT, apparently on the ground that Section 9 of the IPC was not. So in fact, this person, like Man Prasant Beverages, has taken two approaches. So he took two, two approaches. One, that he said that the, we should settle with the operational creditor and that settlement was also done. And after the settlement, after the settlement, he also submitted an application before NCLAT. So one is the settlement, two is an appeal before NCLAT. These are the two processes which the, he started following immediately after the settlement was arrived at. So in March 21, the appeal was withdrawn from NCLAT. The appeal was withdrawn from NCLAT with liberty to apply for revival of the appeal in case of state resettlement fails. Then NCL 80, while allowing the withdrawal of the appeal, granted a stay of formation of COC. So NCL 80 granted a stay on the formation of COC also. So by the impute judgment dated 13 of April 21, rejected the settlement application and fixed the matter for disposal of the application under Regulation 30A of the IBA regulation after hearing all creditors. So the, the, the impugned judgment dated 13.4 rejected the settlement. So the settlement was rejected. So in this case, uh, the action is that the first of all, there is a settlement within two days. The corporate debtor has taken two actions. One, he settled and two, that he filed an application before NCLAT. Now, these are, the, these are the things which has happened. See, there are basically two things that they started together. In the meantime, the RP is also filing an application under Section 30A for withdrawal. So, reject, settlement finally got rejected by the NCLT. But why NCLT will reject the settlement, it's not known. But in this case, the settlement, in fact, got rejected. Therefore, the appeal was filed regarding the correctness of the orders. 
and the appeal was filed uh, by the NCLT Ahmedabad bench rejecting the application of the appellant under section 12A. Subsequently, the above order, the IR, the COC was also constituted. The appellant uh, preferred a special uh, edit petition. Now, this was an issue before Honorable Supreme Court. Issue before the Honorable Supreme Court whether the CIP withdrawal application under section 12A of the IBC can or cannot be kept pending for the constitution of the COC. So it was clear. It was clear in this case. The section 12 capital A of the IBC and regulation 30A of IBBI regulation and also rule 11 of the NCLT rules submitted that such provisions clearly permit settlement between the creditor and the debtor and withdrawal of the proceeding prior to the constitution of COC. Const prior to the, uh, even prior to the constitution of COC, this was a case where the settlement was actually impacted prior to the constitution of COC. So therefore, uh, various judgments and everything was used. The, the, the in fact, apparent also used Swiss Ribbon, apparent also used Ashok G. Rajani. However, the apparent is actually making it too complicated. It's a simple case of withdrawal. The respondents were saying that the submissions advanced on behalf of the respondent is that the settlement between the creditor and the cooperator had been reached and the requisition form FA has been filed with the signed of the format. The counsel for the respondents submitted that both 12A and regulation 30A, the word may had been used. Additionally, it has been objected on their behalf that the appellant ought to have availed alternative remedy by filing an appeal before the NCLAT. The IRP has also raised the issue regarding non-clearance of his fees. These are the various judgments which has been used and relied by the uh, appellant in this case. Now the Supreme Court says, first of all, a settlement prior to the constitution of COC and NCLT rules. Now the NCLT rule says, rule 11 of the National Company, the tribunal rule says, the con it is inherent power on the NCLT to pass appropriate order for meeting the ends of justice or to prevent abuse of the process of the tribunal. And then is the uh, the application for withdrawal was filed on 10th of May. The NCLT ought to have immediately taken the decision on the application, but that was also delayed. That decision was also delayed. Once the parties had settled the disputes, even before the COC had been constituted, the application ought to have been allowed. Then and there, rather than wait, the other creditors to jump into foray and start submitting their claims. Now, NCLT finally held in this case, Ankit, that the application under Section 12A is a right of the corporate debtor. It cannot be delayed. And in such cases, I think all the professional colleagues should be very, very careful. Once Section 12A application is submitted, Regulation 30A is applicable, then in that case, it would be really not possible to start learning again. But yes, the application should be accepted. So, Ankit, uh, what else now? Do you have any comment on this? I think, uh, like, uh, I think it's all related to delays at NCLT, um, and uh, this is something that, like, there is no reason for delay here, right? This there was just delay that caused the company to it was suffer. Only a delay. It was so only delay. So the main problem is delay. You know, this company went to the Supreme Court, filed a writ petition, got relief. But there oh. are many other companies where we see delays and we see, you know, some like uh, the companies hanging, uh, everyone hanging rather, not only the CDs. So I think the delays as a culprit. So the day, delays need to be managed. So the last judgment of the day is Ajay Kumar Raj, uh, uh, Radeshyam Goenka versus Tourism Finance Corporation of India Limited. The name of the corporator is again the name of the name of the corporate debtor in this case is again Rainbow Papers Limited and the Honorable Justice Sanjay Kishan Kaul and Justice Abhay Srinivas Oka and Justice J B Pardiwala. These are uh, the names of the judges and the name of the corporate debtor in this case is Rainbow Paper. However, this, this case is not the same rainbow paper, which we have seen where the statutory uh, authorities were given a right as 
secured operational creditors. Now, in this case, the appellant, appellant's name is Ajay Kumar Radeshyam Goenka. Now, this Ajay Kumar Radeshyam Goenka has issued some checks and he is seeking protection under Section 138 once the insolvency process is going on. So, he cannot get protection and the company that would not give protection because there is no such, uh, there is no such kind of uh, option available uh, that this is not, uh, uh, section 138 can be also stayed or the criminal proceedings can also be stayed. Uh, so the, uh, this the particular judgment says very clearly that the criminal complaints are filed before chief metropolitan magistrate and it is under section 190 of the code of criminal procedures so there are these are totally different from insolvency uh, law so therefore it was said that this uh, there is no relief to the issuer of check under section 138 of the negotiable instrument act even if the company is under insolvency or even if he himself is also under insolvency. There is no such precedence that they have given some kind of uh, some kind of uh, benefit of moratorium. So this, this is very clear that the moratorium is not available. Anything else is not something which is uh, interesting here. So we can see if there are questions available. Just see in case there are some questions available. So, Mr. Sudarshan is asking that when a company is under liquidation process under Section 33, can the SEC approve for withdrawal of liquidation process under Section 12A and Sorry? file? So, during liquidation, he's saying if the liquidation process is going on, can the SEC approve for withdrawal of liquidation process under Section 12A and file an IA and hand over the company to the erstwhile management? Or is there any judgment which empowers the SCC for withdrawal of the liquidation process? I don't think so. When the, when the liquidation starts, hmm. the first option is to keep the company as a going concern and you can sell it as a going concern. Hmm. The second option is under Section 230 of the Companies Act in case you are continuing with the company and you are still buying a, trying to buy, buy a, fire, a buyer. But the third situation that you are seeing, that situation what I understand is that the CIRP started and what exactly situation which a particular... So, CIP started, liquidation has also started in Section 33 now. Now, the SCC or rather the creditors are keen to hand over the company back to the promoters and exit the liquidation process and I settle the whole it, matter. I believe it can still be, it can still be settled. It can be settled. It can be settled. Hmm. Then, if the, uh, the next question is if the COC constitutes only of OCs and resolution applicant, the are MSME promoters. So the resolution applicant is the M, uh, resolution applicant is the MSME promoter, and uh, the then the resolution applicant proposes full payment of all OCs. Can that proposal be rejected by a COC with one OC being in the majority who wants to acquire the CD and not interested in settlement of his claim? So he is getting full money, but he is still rejecting the claim because he wants himself to be the resolution applicant only. He does not want the MSME promoter to take the company. The OC now wants the company for himself and he is sitting on the chair in the COC. That's the question. So look, Ankit, first of all, the creditors can submit a resolution plan. It, yes. They are allowed to submit a resolution plan. So, so the, the resolution uh, plan, uh, mm -hmm. plan, even if it is approved by the committee of creditors, should not be violative of any law. Right. It should not be conditional. Mm -hmm. And these are the two things. Like even if the resolution plan is submitted by a creditor who is part of the committee of creditors, the resolution plan should offer an amount, uh, whatever he's offering. But not, not that he later on he, sa he says that uh, I am not aware or something like that. But yes, it is possible that in liquidation process also the company can be brought back to section 12a that is possible so here the question i think is that the company seems to be a viable company where the ocs are proposed to be settled by the resolution applicant being the promoter and also the resolution applicant being one of the operational creditors so the fight now is between both of them uh, because both of them want the company <laughs> <laughs> 
I think that's its process of bidding. I think mm-hmm. now we recommend this um, challenge mechanism use kare. And then the challenge we, mechanism may did the creators go pay the name says other case the day. No, but I think in case the money is available, then the COC will take a call whether it will be paid to shareholders or it will be paid less to the uh, employees and more to the shareholders. So the promoter can come up with an increased plan. You're saying the solution yes. can be that he can say that I will not only pay fully to the OCs, I will also pay to the shareholders, whereas the operational creditor may not be able to do that. So that's no, the that's solution to this problem. Yeah, that's yes. an innovative, that's an interesting solution. So, uh, uh, and uh, so if there is any evidence of fraud by promoters, but the RP has not filed application under 66, whether the promoters can file resolution plan if the CD is MSME. So if there is a uh, application and let us see this uh, regulation, it is very important to see that regulation, what it says. The regulation, CIRP regulation says, in case we see the CIRP regulation 37, I think it will be 37. Just a minute. I was trying to show a regulation, but then that's not required. But then we have already given the answer. I'm not able to find the regulation now. Right. So section 66, if it is not filed, then uh, the resolution plan can be submitted by the CD, who is an MSM. I'm saying that it is the duty of the RP to submit resolution plan before the committee of creditors, along with along with a report on the uh, POFE transactions. So if he's that, aware of any POF transaction, so if, if yeah, so, right, got it. So in case he is aware of a puff transaction and even if he is not filed an application under 66, so then that's a double whammy that one, he is not uh, disclosing that to the COC. Second, he is not filing an application under 66. So there can be two defaults in that process. Right. Because he's supposed to do both in case he's in no of any such problem. Yeah. Another question, land belongs to the PG and building and p and belong to the company. Companies under CRP, can FC lender go for composite resolution plan? Yes, I think now there has a change in the regulation. So this is possible. This is from Mr. Gurg from SBI. Yeah. I think uh, we are saying uh, uh, to Mr. Gurg uh, that the, what exactly the, uh, was the question that he asked, Ankit? Okay. So, Mr. Gurg said that land belongs to the personal guarantor. Yes, land belongs to personal guarantor and the building and the plant actually belongs to the corporate company. Actor. Yeah, the now, CD. Now, in this CD case, is under CRP. Now, the CD is under CIRP. So, the question is like, can we sell it collectively? What is the question? Can we pass a resolution plan where the land is also part of the process? Yes, NCLAT has given a judgment. NCLAT, I think in the last three or four months, the NCLAT has given a judgment that if this is a scenario and uh, if this is a scenario and it is approved by all the committee members, see, then it is uh, uh, possible. Why I am saying so? Because if it is dissented by some of the people who have personal guarantee of the promoter, if it is dissented by some of the people who have personal guarantee of <clears throat> promoters, then it will be difficult for the adjudicating authority to approve that transition plan. Otherwise, it is uh, possible, and Clat has said that yes, it can be sold collectively. <laughs> so, I think that's about it. And if there are any other questions, we can always take them uh, offline. <clears throat> and uh, one of the questions is from Mr. Sridharan asking that RP is insisting to give a low value. So, I think Mr. Sridharan is talking about a valuation assignment. So, Mr. Sridharan, uh, the value is responsible for his value, irrespective of what the RP says. So, your report should be good enough to be uh, <clears throat> to pass through any uh, any any uh, uh, any any uh, inspection, any uh, anything uh, that you know happens. Uh, there can be contention on the valuation report. So, looking into the importance of valuation under IBC, I think we have thought of uh, the next session to be on valuation under IBC. So, we'll discuss this at length maybe next Saturday. Thank you very much, uh, all uh, members of our audience. Thanks a lot.
as ankit said that the next episode is going to be on the valuation process various judgments on valuation various ibbi orders on valuers the importance of valuation regulations and the judgment that's what is the i'm not sure whether we'll be able to conduct in one min one hour i think ankit is going to add some proposed international valuation standards so that also would be discussed so thank you uh, all have a good weekend thank you thank you everyone